The Undeclared War is really quite the thrilling series from start to finish. I did not know what to expect going in, and uh, I was blown away by it. Um, Thank you. Wow, it explores, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love the way it explores so many, you know, socio-political themes that are really timely for the present. But I'm curious, you know, how did the concept for this series really come to mind for you? You know, what do people like me do? You know, <laughs> Our job is to use a really powerful medium, which is what TV is, at least in my view, um, to try to act as a kind of notice board for the general public. You know, there's so much that goes on in our world that we're not really clear on. Some of it affects us very di directly. Um, some of this stuff, you know, costs our nations a great deal of money, and yet it, it's sort of going on quietly behind the scenes. I, I don't mean necessarily that there's some kind of malicious motive going on, but it's just not something that people are generally aware of. And I go looking for that kind of thing, whether it's a personal story or or something to do with public policy, you know, in my country or in your country or, you know, anywhere that impinges on our society, really. And I've been doing this for the best part of 40 years. Um, so when I started to hear about this hot war that was going on in a in a domain of conflict, cyber, that that I you know, I didn't even know it was formalized as a domain of conflict. You know, I sort of knew about land, sea, and air. I didn't really know about cyber. And that there's there's a hot war going on in it right now that is inherently escalatory. Um, and therefore inherently really dangerous at a time when the world is dangerous generally. I thought, whoa, uh, people don't know about this. Uh, maybe we should make a TV program about it. So that's really where it started. It was just that sort of sense that there was something unknown that should be known. So how much research then did you find you had to do to to – really help fuel this story well the first thing to say is i'm you know i'm no computer expert uh although i've been using apple Macs since 1991 so you know i sort of i'm an early adopter i guess but um uh so to understand well even uh, let's let's rephrase that because there's no way i'm going to understand this stuff but to even be, begin to be able to have a conversation with people who understand it, I had a lot of work to do. And it took five years to make the show from inception to transmission in the UK, um, which in the UK transmission occurred just to, just to three or four weeks before the US transmission uh, on Peacock. So... Um, of of those five years, I would say three years were just research, really. Um, probably took us about two years to actually make the show. Of course, COVID got in the way, but by some pure fluke, I was in the writing phase at that moment, which requires me to do what I'm doing now, you know, sit at this screen in my room and type. So bizarrely it it fell you know we were all locked down but i wasn't going anywhere anyway because i was writing so yeah for about three years of research i would say although you know it continued and i'm already doing research on you know a possible second season so it, it's you know what it's like um you know it's a continuous process really with that said then what would you say was one of the more interesting things or one of your favorite things that you learned from that long research process here in the uk gchq is a really secret place you know so um just starting to understand a bit about that world by talking to people who had interacted with that world that for me was was quite interesting you know this was a, a closed world to me previously um, probably then the next thing, the next most interesting thing for me was trying to get my 
non-technical head around how a really good coder's brain works. And that's where the whole code world sequence of, you know, being inside Sarah's head and seeing how she visualizes what she's doing inside the computer sort of came into existence, really, because I was trying to understand how some, I mean, you could call Sarah a kind of coding prodigy. So how does someone like that's brain work and how on earth can I sort of convey that to an audience who is 99% unlikely to, to, to know much about, you know, coding and that kind of thing. So those were probably the two most exciting and interesting aspects of it, but it, it was constantly exciting and interesting. I was learning stuff I didn't know all the time. With uh, talking about Sara, I mean, she is certainly one of the most compelling characters of the series, and Hannah does a phenomenal job bringing her to life. What was it like looking for the right person, though, to fully embody uh, Sara during the casting process? Well, long is the short answer. I mean, I think I think we took about two years of auditioning different Saras and Hannah was there right at the start and obviously was a very strong candidate from really early on. Um, but I just needed to be sure and that, you know, I wanted to try working with her in, in you know, in lots of different parts of the show. I have a rather sort of selfish view that auditioning is kind of free rehearsal, really. And also, particularly with the lead, I'm learning about the script at the same time, you know, by hearing a really good actor like Hannah and one or two of the others who were in the running, um, working the material, reading the lines, playing the scenes. I'm learning about what's working and what's not what's not working and given how intense it is once we get on the set how little time we have to do everything we need to do that is gold dust for me you know I make those changes in if you like offline you know without it costing tens of thousands of dollars so uh it, it's a win-win a long auditioning process as far as I'm concerned although it's obviously very frustrating for the actors Sure, that can be understandable. I mean, don't want to keep them on the hook too long. <laughs> um, Absolutely. And so uh, alongside her, I mean, Simon is also uh, great as Danny. It's such a it's a unique turn for him in how serious it is. And I'm curious, you know, did you have Simon in mind as far as like a front runner right out the gate? Or was there a few other actors you also had in mind for Danny? Well, with this kind of thing, you always have a few people in mind. But I was really intrigued by the idea of casting Simon Pegg right from the start because, um, you, you know, you can watch him in the various roles he's played, some of them really sort of out-and-out out comedic, others that not so much, but he's always required to deliver a funny line with a – you know, with the extraordinary comic timing that he has. But I could see that there was a really terrific actor in there. And I don't know why I'm sounding surprised because comedy is one of the hardest things to do well as an actor. But, um, and I thought, I just want, look, what, what he generates is warmth, I think, on screen. What he generates is a sort of sense of honesty and, um, trust, uh, compassion. When I watch him, I feel these kinds of things. And those were all qualities that I wanted to imbue, you know, into, into the, the characterization of Danny. So and he was always going to be a strong contender, really. But what I didn't know was whether somebody who, you know, had been making his life in, in the largest movies there are, um, whether he would want to come and slum it in a in a TV show, and it turned out he did. Luckily, uh, you know, we were all the beneficiaries. Well, he was even telling me because I, I asked him about his recent return to television, and he said it's no longer 
your either movie or TV, they've really become very much on the same wavelengths uh, of quality. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm glad he was willing to join it though. Um, so then what was it like finding the look of this show? Because, I mean, you were talking a little bit about trying to find a way to bring Sara's uh, mind process to life, but what was it like finding the overall look of this series? I think what I was most concerned to achieve was a sense of immediacy. You know, I, lo I love where TV is at the moment because I, I'm a guy who grew up on science fiction, you know, in books. So I, I'm what we say here, like a pig in shit, you know, um, maybe you don't want to quote that. But <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, you, you know, I, I get to see the kind of shows I I dreamed about seeing when I was a kid, when, you know, the idea of a sort of visual effect was to hang a piece of cardboard from a piece of string from just out of shot, you know, and hope no one noticed that it was, you know, hanging there rather than moving elegantly through space. Um, but the reality is there's a sort of, as a result, there's there's quite a heightened sort of fantastical quality to a great deal of stuff that gets made these days. And what I wanted to say with The Undeclared War is this is real. This is a cautionary tale. This could be happening now. This could be what happens in two years' time when we in the UK have another general election or when you guys have your midterms or something like that. Um, so I wanted a realistic style. I, I didn't want it to be too glossy or too, you know, sort of luminously bright. Um, so I, a, a Gavin Finney, the, you know, my sort of longtime DOP collaborator and I, we, we used a handheld technique. Pretty much everything was shot handheld, although Gavin uses a rig that has some stabilization in it. So, you you know, you don't feel sort of seasick all the time. At least I hope not. Um, and we very much used the sort of point of view and reaction technique. So Sarah was our focus, except when we were, you know, doing the scenes in Russia. And we followed her around. Camera didn't get ahead of her. So the audience doesn't really have the advantage over Sarah. The audience is always sort of going on the journey with her. So the camera kind of sits on her shoulder, handheld, follows her along a corridor, follows her into a room rather than preceding her into the room um, and sees what she sees and then cuts back onto her face for a reaction. That's what I call a point of view and reaction technique. And that, for me, and it, it's something I've been doing for a while now, it it, it creates a, a sense of reality and immediacy and of discovery, you know, which when you're trying to reveal stuff that you think the public may not be aware of, that that fits pretty well. Well, I couldn't agree more. It uh, it, it works very effectively in the series. And uh, so even though, you know, you, you say you've said that you've directed for quite a while now, I'm curious, did you have any major properties though that you turn to for visual inspiration uh for the look of your film not really that's probably a failing in me um I, i'm you know i just when i'm working on stuff when i'm writing it or on the occasions when i get sent scripts to to um consider directing that have been written by other people i really just see it playing in my head and i don't know where that comes from or you know whether that is subconsciously drawing on, on references um i don't know it, it i'm not trying to be arrogant here but it, i'm i'm not thinking oh we, this should have a look of a canaletto or you know this should this should feel like a sort of early denny villeneuve film or you know i'm not, i'm not i'm just thinking what's right for this scene you know, what's right for this show? Or what's right for this character? You know, how do I need to convey this character? Um, so I'm probably, you know, there are certainly more sort of elegant visual stylists working than me, that's for sure. But when my focus is very much on character, you know, I'm, I have a reputation for better or worse as, a, as an actor's director. Um, I'm lucky enough to be able to 
work with some wonderful actors, some of whom were just starting out in their career. And I've given a little helping hand to some really quite well-known people uh, who were just starting out. So that's where my focus tends to be on, on character, on performance. And I'm trying to find a style that seems to help convey the correct emotion and mood, but without trying to show off, hey, look at me, you know, look look at what a sort of visual wizard I am. That to me, that kind of just gets in the way of of the storytelling. Gotcha. Well, I, I think that's a, a good approach to to how you film uh, is to focus on the character over style. Um, now, uh, before we let you go, uh, you did mention uh, uh, contemplating ideas for a second season. And I had talked with Simon and he said he also had talked with you about that possibility. And so I'm curious, you know, the show ends on a note where it could close or it could go on. What are your what are you really feeling for the p- possible future of this show? Well, you know, ultimately, that's in the hands of the of the broadcasters, the financiers. We we have ideas about another season. Um, I don't know if you happen to, it depends how how wide awake you were in the sort of depths of episode six. Um, but at one point, um, there's a reference to how how have the people who designed the malware that is attacking Britain been able to hardwire a MAC address of a particular computer inside GCHQ into, into their code? I mean, how could they know that? You know, a MAC address is a fairly, I think it's described in, I think I described it in the script as like a fingerprint, you know, how, how and this is a sort of, super secret facility how could they know um the mac address to write it into their code that was not a sort of unintentional loose end that would would possibly be a starting point for a a season two so i'm i'm not going to say more than that but i'm just going to say that Others might wonder, you know, within that GCHQ world, are going to wonder, okay, how did they get that MAC address? Because Gabriel, um, the sort of neurodiverse character who kind of saves the day, says, because Sarah said, how could that? It's impossible. And he says, no, it's obvious. And she's angry, you know, because she doesn't like to be patronized. And she says, you know, what do you mean it's obvious? Well, someone told them. So maybe that's where we might start. Yeah, you heard it first on Screen Rant. <laughs> well, I'm very excited to share that with my readers then, as well as just to continue to spread the word about this show. It, again, blew me away from start to finish. And I think people who haven't already seen it are going to really enjoy it. So, Peter, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. I greatly appreciate it. Okay. My pleasure. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a good rest of your week.